Okay, I'm going to talk about how you might get evidence that your election got the right answer. And also about the other side of that coin in which you might not notice that anything had gone wrong, but you might not necessarily have got the right answer. We're going to start with a short survey. It goes like this. Uh, if you have your device, which everybody does, of course, you can go to this URL. Please be honest. Please give me your real name, because I'll be checking the list off the attendee list. And this is for science, so please tell me the truth. Uh, it's, it's a little election about cheating. And you can say, I cheated on my finals, my taxes, my spouse, or because this is America, there has to be a writing. So, first lesson from this little survey, I mean election, is first of all, getting evidence of the right election outcome is really easy. All we need to do is get all the voters in the same room and publish the complete list of public names and votes, oh, which doesn't quite fit on my screen for some reason. Um, anyway, you get the idea that if everybody can see the same public list of their inputs, and everybody can check that their own vote is accurately represented in the list. And then everybody can look through the entire list of contributions and double check the tally. Then we have very good evidence that the survey outcome, oops, I mean election outcome, is exactly what the voters wanted. So the aim of end-to-end -end verifiability, without going into too many details about precise definitions, the aim is to replicate this level of evidence in a situation in which we can't fit all of the vote or cannot fit all of the voters into the one room. And we want to base that evidence on maybe some auditing assumptions, maybe some crypto assumptions, but not on any assumptions about trusting that individual computers are secure, trusting that software has done the right thing, or trusting particular individuals with the integrity of the result. There is one other detail that you may have picked up, which is we'd also like to keep the votes private. So I chose a deliberately shocking example, but there's a serious point, which is that even if in California you're pretty willing to wear your um, political affiliations on your sleeve, that's not necessarily the case for every democracy or even for every voter in the United States. Even if you don't care about your individual vote privacy, the system has to do a good enough job of protecting privacy that we can be confident everybody really voted their conscience. In fact, Josh Benelow pointed out very early in the voting research literature that the privacy requirement for voting is actually really strong. You shouldn't be able to generate a proof of how you voted, even if you're working really hard to do so, which is actually stronger than just kind of the passive privacy requirement that we usually think of. Now, I argued a few minutes ago that end-to-end -end verifiability is really easy, but the reason I get 20 minutes to talk is that end-to-end -end verifiability with privacy is really hard. And that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. So privacy is important. End-to-end -end verifiability with privacy is hard. I hope it's clear to this crowd that verifiability is important. Uh, Dana mentioned the Volkswagen um, emissions scandal. And I think it is relevant, because I think what it shows is that asking a small number of certification authorities to keep an eye on a small number of very clever engineers is not actually any guarantee of integrity. And if you think of the pressures and the incentives on an electoral system, if anything, the amount of money involved and the kind of pressure that could be applied is even worse than in the automotive industry. So any kind of evidence about electoral integrity has to come out to the public. And in particular, at the very least, it has to come out to the election observers or the scrutineers that that democracy would usually put in a polling place or an accounting centre to watch the conduct of the election. Alex pointed out our work showing that the New South Wales iVote system was not secure. But I've thought about it a lot, and it's nearly a year since the election now, and what really strikes me is, as the most important thing is not just that it wasn't secure, but that it's nearly a year since the election, and we really don't have any good evidence about whether that vulnerability was exploited or not. So it's not just that it was insecure, it's also that it wasn't verifiable, so we can't even quantify the extent of a problem, even though we knew that the vulnerability to manipulation was there. 
The officials who ran the system have said publicly that about 4,000 people verified. That's a little under 2% of the total number of votes that came in off the system. But the verification mechanism, even if it was complete, which I think Alex has argued very well it really wasn't, even if it was complete, its value is as an auditing kind of mechanism. So the total number of successes isn't really the relevant statistic. The relevant statistic is the rate of failure. In other words, how, what fraction of the people who tried to verify failed for some reason? And that statistic just hasn't been made publicly available. I've asked a couple of times and got kind of ambiguous answers. So when the electoral authorities themselves don't really seem to understand what the right statistic to report actually is, I think that's a good indication that all of that evidence should be designed into the system in a way that it just automatically gets sent out to the public. And that's what I would describe as a crucial property of real verifiability in an election context. Okay, that is the last thing I'm going to say about iVote. The rest of my talk is about a project in my home state of Victoria. So let's talk about what we'd like to try and achieve out of an electoral system. It's important to realise that this idea of getting public evidence out of secret votes is as old as democracy. It's, there's really nothing special about computers here. In fact, the Australian ballot, called a ballot in Australia, is, was specifically designed and carefully engineered in response to a serious security problem. There used to be rampant voter coercion back in the day when voters had to bring their own piece of paper into the polling place and when they'd get it from a party or a candidate who would give them a fairly identifiable looking one, people would be beaten up on the way to the polls. So some bright spark in the 19th century had the idea of engineering a system in which the government gave everybody the same looking ballot and they marked marks on the same piece of paper giving us both vote privacy and the opportunity to watch the box into which all of the votes were being placed so that we could have a public counting process afterwards. Not everybody uses the Australian ballot. The French have a different system with a glass urn and little envelopes. Um, the ancient Athenians used little bronze discs, which they carefully dropped one at a time into a big voting urn. The bronze discs are very subtly different, but you can't tell from a distance. And of course, here in California, Philip Stark and Ron Rivest, pictured here, have pioneered the idea of statistical audits on a fraction of the paper evidence that give you some good statistical confidence without having to count all the votes. All of these systems have the same theme of giving a good public evidence trail while keeping individual votes private. So how can we think about doing that in an electronic context? There's actually a great research literature about end-to-end -end verifiability. The Scantegrity system was used in local elections in Maryland. Uh, the Helios system is used over the internet for elections for the International Association of Cryptologic Researchers. And there are numerous other systems that have been designed or deployed in non-government elections, some over the internet and some in polling places. Did anybody use, any IACR members use Helios? Anybody vote in that election? One. Oh no, there's a few people. Okay, keep your hand up if you challenged at least one ciphertext that you built. One in the back. Keep your hand up if you challenged two or more ciphertexts that you built. Nobody. Okay. so. We've discovered that we can trust the IACR to throw one coin, but not two per voter. And this theme will continue through the talk. So Helios is an excellent system, but there are good reasons that we couldn't use it in a real government election. Oh, I should also say there's a considerable industry of people who can print up a pretty marketing pamphlet claiming that their proprietary system is end-to-end -end verifiable, but not encouraging you, or indeed not allowing you, to inspect their source code, their protocol, or anything else that might give you any ability to assess whether or not their claims are true. I've looked at a few of them from a distance to the extent that I can, and I've never seen anything that provides anything like the level of evidence that either the academic systems provide or that we really need for uh, election integrity. So now I'm going on to the main topic of my talk, which is a project that we ran in my home state of Victoria 
to run an end-to-end -end verifiable system in a polling place that allowed people to vote at a location either outside of the state or outside of their normal precinct. And in particular, the system took nearly 1,000 votes from the Australian Embassy in London. So there's lots of expat Australians who live in London, and they wanted to vote in the Victorian state election, and the State Election Commission didn't want to haul a big bag of paper ballots back on an aeroplane. So this system was designed to give those voters some evidence that their votes had been properly returned and accurately included in the tally and also some other pre-poll voting within the state. It was organised by Craig Burton at the Victorian Electoral Commission and led out of the University of Surrey. And just to give the physical context here, here's New South Wales, uh, about which uh, Alex and I did some work on the giant internet voting system. Sydney's about here. Uh, the project I'm about to talk about is here in this little blue triangle called Victoria, and the University of Melbourne is right here in the centre. So just to give a bit of cultural context, too, um, I promised that I wouldn't tell Americans how to run their democracy. <laughs> but <laughs> even, in even in sensible countries that run their elections on the weekend, we still have a bit of an issue about the increasing difficulty for people to get into a particular polling place on polling day. So there's a fair bit of pressure for a great deal more flexibility about how people access either the polling place or the process of voting. And about a third of Victorians vote before election day one way or another. Okay, so here's how this system works. It took 1,121 votes in the state election, and again, in supervised polling places. It's based on the pret a end-to-end verifiable cryptographic voting system. And the voter comes into the polling place, interacts with a computer, and takes home with them an encrypted version of their vote that looks a bit like this. The idea is that while they're there in the polling place, they're interacting with the system in a way that gives them some good evidence that this complicated-looking thing accurately reflects the vote they intended to cast. Then the encrypted votes are posted on the web bulletin board, and there's some fancy crypto involved in a clever proof that they're accurately shuffled and properly decrypted. Then finally, the scrutineers who are watching the paper count, and remember, this is only a tiny fraction of the total votes in the election. The scrutineers who are watching the paper count can check the output of this system and check that that output correctly goes into the paper count that they're carefully observing. Uh, it's an open source system. GPL code is out on Bitbucket, and there are quite a few academic papers that describe what the protocol is and why we think it has the security properties that it does. I should say, by the way, that I came to this from a crypto background, and I used to think that this little bullet was the most interesting part of the whole system, all this nifty um, fancy mixed nets and zero-knowledge proofs of decryption and so on. And it's worth saying 10 years later that this part is basically a solved problem, but we've subsequently realised that all of the other bits are really hard. All right, so here's a schematic diagram of how it all works. Here's Steve casting his vote. His vote gets uploaded to the Electoral Commission server and also printed out for him to take home. It's the same information. It's posted, uh, the election outcome is announced, and then all of these proofs about why the election outcome is right are posted on the web. So the obvious questions are, how do you know that your vote is cast as, they, as you intended? How do you know that your vote is properly included into the tally in the way that you cast it? And how do you know that all the votes are properly decrypted and tallied? Well, I'm not really going to explain the third bullet point, even though it's really cool. But I'm going to show you roughly how you check that that encrypted, unreadable printout really does match the way that you intended to vote. And that's particularly tricky since it can't say how you voted, because if it revealed how you voted, you could use it to sell your vote. So Preto Voter uses pre-prepared paper ballot forms. The crucial idea is that you get your list of candidates, but they're in a random order. And everybody gets a fresh and different random order. Nobody else is supposed to know what your random order is. The information that defines the order of the candidates is also printed on the ballot form as a ciphertext at the bottom. 
So you vote by filling in a separate piece of paper with the numbers that match. So, for example, if you wanted to vote one for green, you put a one in the second box. In most of the United States, you're now done. If you're in San Francisco, if you're in San Francisco or Alameda, you've got a couple more preferences to express, and that works fine. If you're in Australia, you have to fill in the whole list, and there can be anywhere from two or three to 20 or 30 candidates on a Victorian uh, ballot. So if you're a bit paranoid, and all of my friends are a bit paranoid, the first question you would ask is, hang on a minute, how can I make sure that this encrypted value over here really does accurately match this list of candidate names that I've been told? And the answer is that you can audit. So I skipped that slide, but we can check back here. You can, at any point, challenge as many ballots as you like. So you can ask as soon as you get the ballot for this ciphertext at the bottom to be decrypted, and so that you can walk home with some proof that that ciphertext matches that list of candidates. Then you get another ballot and vote on that ballot instead, because you can't vote on something that you cannot vote on something that you've challenged. Because if you could, you could prove how you voted. Righty, -ay. pardon. <laughs> okay, so here we go. We're voting again. Once you've filled in, once you've challenged some ballots, taken one that you're happy enough to vote on, filled in some preferences, and carefully checked that the numbers you wanted to cast line up with the candidates you wanted to vote for, you shred the list of candidate names in the polling place before you work, before you walk out, and you take home this printout, which is meant to be a schematic of that complicated-looking photograph that I showed you before. And the crucial thing about this is it doesn't reveal how you voted because you can't recover the order of the candidates from this thing. Then you go home and check the giant list of included votes to look for your own. And if you're a real geek, you write your own verifier for the fancy crypto mixing and shuffling proofs. So this system really belongs in the collection of carefully engineered ways of generating a genuine evidence trail out of secret votes. But there are some important practicalities, both for better and for worse. So for better, we get evidence of the proper transfer of accurately recorded votes, as the voters intended, across the kinds of distances or time intervals in which a paper evidence trail might be really hard to justify or really hard to secure. Many of the best systems combine a paper evidence trail with an end-to-end verifiable system, but in this case, the Electoral Commission really, really didn't want to be hauling pieces of paper back from London. So that's the positive practical outcome. The practical challenge, and the reason I put this photo of this ancient clunky computer from the 1960s on my slide, is that it's still really very clunky and hard to use. And getting people to actually do the verification steps is really hard. So in particular, I said this step in which you try to verify that the candidate list you've been given really matches your encrypted um, the encrypted description of the same thing, that's a really crucial step in verification. It turned out that the electoral authorities in Victoria really didn't get that. It was not intuitive to them at all. They implemented it, they trained their poll workers to respond to it, but they didn't tell the voters they were supposed to do it. They did tell the voters they were supposed to check on the web that their receipt had been properly included. And about 13% of voters did that step. But they didn't do the ballot auditing step. So I don't really know why. I'm not really sure why one kind of verification seemed really natural and intuitive, and the other kind of verification didn't. I do know that we have to fix that bit. We have to make sure that every step in the verification process is not just the thing they have to do in case the crazy woman from the university comes and hassles them. It has to be a natural thing that they do because they understand it's a crucial part of building the evidence trail. So we haven't got that big quite right yet. It's both a design problem and an education problem. 
So, here's the big question. Could we do this kind of thing securely from home via the internet? The IACR does it, why can't everybody? And the answer is no. <laughs> Dan said I should just stop here, but I feel sort of obliged to say why in my last two seconds. I would say that end-to-end -end verifiability is a necessary condition for those who absolutely insist on voting on the internet, but I completely agree with both of the prior speakers that voting over the internet is a really bad idea. I think this project has a lot to say about why that is still a long way off. And in particular, in addition to all of the other security risks that Alex identified, the difficulty of actually getting people to verify is the main practical problem that we experienced in that project. Well, it's only going to be worse over the internet. Where are people going to get their verification instructions from? How are we going to quantify how many people actually did it? Everything that could go wrong in this kind of a project is so much harder in a remote setting than in a supervised setting. The privacy and coercion issues, the voter authentication issues that we didn't even have to deal with because we were working in a supervised polling place remain completely unsolved for voting over the internet. So this is my last slide. Um, in summary, the really important thing about election outcomes is public evidence that they're correct, and that's really hard in the context of private votes. Secure internet voting is unsolved, and I think that instead of think saying we have a problem therefore we have to do internet voting, we should be examining the problem that we have and thinking about how we could make secure voting in a polling place more flexible without throwing out integrity for the sake of convenience. All right, thank you very much.